Hi, everyone. Welcome and good evening. My name is Lauren Artilius, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science and the Harvard Library, I'm excited to introduce this virtual event with Andrew Steele, presenting his new book, Ageless, The New Science of Getting Older Without Getting Old. I hope you're all doing well and hanging in there. Thank you so much for joining us virtually tonight. Tonight's event is the latest installment in our Harvard Science Book Talk series, which works to bring the authors of recently published science literature to our Cambridge community and beyond. Coming up in the series on Tuesday, April 27th at 7 p.m., we'll host pioneer in emotion AI, Rana El Kaliubi for her book, Girl Decoded, a scientist's quest to reclaim our humanity by bringing emotional intelligence to technology. To learn more about this and our other upcoming virtual events, you can visit harvard.com and sign up for our email newsletter or check out the page harvard.com backslash science for more info. We also have a Science Research Public Lectures YouTube channel where you can view previous talks that you might have missed. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. So if you have a question for our author at any time during the talk tonight, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. In the chat, I'll be posting a link to purchase Ageless on harvard.com, as well as a link to donate in support of this series and our store. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. So thank you to our partners at Harvard University, and thank you to all of you for showing up and tuning in, in support of authors, publishers, indie bookselling, and especially for science, because it really, really matters in this difficult time and always. Finally, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings over this past year, technical issues may arise. So if they do, we'll do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. Thank you for your patience and understanding. And now I am delighted to introduce tonight's speaker. After obtaining a PhD in physics from the University of Oxford, Andrew Steele decided that aging was the most important scientific challenge of our time and switched fields to computational biology. He worked at the Francis Crick Institute using machine learning to decode our DNA and predict heart attacks using patients' medical records. He is now a full-time science writer and presenter based in London, and he has appeared on Discovery and the BBC. Tonight, he'll be guiding us on a journey through the work being done to understand and combat the cause beneath much human death and suffering, aging itself. While we've come to accept that physical and mental deterioration is an inevitable inevitable part of growing older. Not all of the species on earth decline with age the same way that we do. Andrew's work introduces us to the scientists attempting to understand why that might be and to develop theories that and therapies that target the biological processes responsible for our own age-based frailty. Kat Arney calls ageless a fascinating, stimulating, and pleasingly practical guide to the science of aging and how we might be able to bend the arrow of biological time to improve our health. And Andrew Scott says, few issues can be more important for our future than ensuring that we age as well as possible. Ageless explains the extraordinary achievements and promise of current scientific research around longevity. Read it and prepare to think differently about your future. We are so pleased to be hosting him here tonight. Without further ado, the digital podium is yours, Andrew. Hi everyone, thank you so much for that introduction and thanks for having me. Um, I thought I'd start out by just giving a bit of an introduction to myself. As you heard, uh, I'm a scientist and a writer and also a campaigner, because I'm really trying to raise the profile of, uh, of, of this issue of ageing. And as you heard, I started out as a physicist, but ended up uh, taking a sort of segue through computational biology and did that for about five years before deciding that uh, aging was just so important and so under-recognised even within biology that I had to write a book about it. And so I'm going to try and uh, tell you a bit about that now. Um, and my book, as you've just heard, is called Ageless, The New Science of Getting Older Without Getting Old. Um, the, the sort of central thesis of the book is that a lot of us think of aging as just a natural process. But I try and make the case that aging is the single greatest humanitarian challenge of our time. And that might sound like a slightly strange claim to make, so I'm going to try and unpack that a bit in the next half hour or so. Um, I'm also going to talk about the fact that, you know, a lot of us think that ageing is inevitable. We think it's just uh, an unavoidable side effect of being alive. And, you know, we, we get old and wrinkly, our animals and, uh, you know, our pets, our farm animals too, they all seem to follow a similar trajectory of decline. But actually, um, we now know that isn't universal around the animal kingdom at all. 
And we also have these experiments that are going on in labs. We've got labs all around the world that have come up with dozens of different ways to slow down and even reverse the process of biological ageing, which is a genuinely exciting development. And it's this combination of things, actually, that I think makes it most exciting. We've got this enormous humanitarian challenge on the one hand, and then on the other, we've got the biology, the science, to rise to that challenge. <coughs> Excuse me. And I think what this means is that we're going to end up having the biggest revolution in the way that we deliver medical care since the discovery of antibiotics. So, um, I, I, as we heard already a couple of times, I, I changed my career from a physicist to a biologist as a result of learning about this stuff. And actually, the reason that I changed my career, uh, I often tell people, is because of a graph. And so I'm going to start out by showing you this graph uh, and see if it can uh, convince you of the importance of this topic too. It's a surprisingly simple graph in some ways. It's just got your age along the bottom of there, and at the side, it's got your risk of death in that year. Now, all of us know that older people are more likely to die, but just how much more likely really shocked me. Uh, let's, without further ado, have a look at what that curve looks like. There you go. You can see it's uh, quite surprising how rapidly it suddenly ascends at the end of life. And I think to really make sense of this, we're going to have to go through the numbers. So let's start on that uh, very left-hand end there. Uh, when you're born, you know, you're zero years old, you've got about a 0.5% chance of not making your first birthday if you're born in a rich country in the developed world in, in modern times. And that's because obviously you can be born with various congenital problems or a genetic issue. But if you're lucky enough to make it through that first year of life, then actually your risk of death carries on going down throughout your childhood until you reach the age of about 10. And current 10-year-olds have a fantastically exciting, important distinction. They are the safest human beings in the history of humanity. They've got a less than 1 in 10,000 chance of not making their 11th birthday, which is really quite amazing if you think about it. You know, they're just incredibly likely to survive. But unfortunately, looking at this graph, you can see it's all downhill, or rather on this curve, uphill from there. Um, when you are 18, you've got about a 1 in 3,000 chance of not making it to your 19th birthday. If you're in your 30s like I am, your risk of death is somewhere in the ballpark of 1 in 1,000 per year. And it's worth just, you know, transposing that, those numbers into your life and thinking about what that would actually mean. If I could somehow continue with that same chance of death throughout my life, that would mean I'd live into my 1,030s on average. And I mean, pretty clearly just based on how old we expect people to live to, but also based on this graph, you can see that isn't what happens. Unfortunately, when you're an adult, your risk of death doubles about every seven or eight years. That means there's an exponential growth in your risk of dying. And I guess in the last uh, year or so, we've all seen the, the, the huge power of exponential growth. Something can start out very small, but rapidly get very big very quickly. And what that means is, you know, doubling a thousand, it doesn't, it, it, or rather doubling one in a thousand, it's still quite a small chance. But as you accelerate through those years, um, by the time you reach 65, you've got about a one percent chance of not making your next birthday and again those odds still actually aren't that bad you know if, if you were 65 and those odds of death continued you'd make it to 165 on average clearly unfortunately by that point one percent is a fairly significant chance it's a number that you know you can start to double it and make some really significant progress so if you're lucky enough to make it to 80 you've got a one in 20 chance of dying that year and if you're fortunate enough uh, fortunate enough to make it into your 90s, so somewhere off the top of this graph, you've got odds of death of about one in six per year. So that's you know life or death at the roll of a dice. And well, there are two ways to look at this graph. The first of which is as a human being and think, my God, this is quite terrifying because I've got this sort of exponential wall of mortality racing towards me as I advance in years. But as a scientist, you look at this graph and you think this is really fascinating because there's this really quite sudden increase in the risk of death starting in the sort of sixth or seventh or eighth decade, depending on how, uh, you know, where you draw the line for sudden increase. What is it that causes this, this synchronised change across our biology that makes us so, so much more likely to die, really, really rather all at once? So the question that we've got to ask ourselves in order to answer this question is what is ageing? When most of us think about ageing, we think about the sort of variety of end effects that we get when ageing happens. We think about the sort of the cosmetic superficial external signs are the most obvious ones, things like wrinkles and grey hair. But obviously they don't have a huge effect on our health, they're just sort of the external signs of something that's going on inside of us. The scarier things are the increase in the risk of diseases, things like cancer, heart disease, stroke and dementia. And these are diseases that we characterise biologically as being caused by the ageing process. The single biggest risk factor for getting one of these diseases is just getting older. So that's obviously quite a scary thing. We've also got uh, a whole range of other changes that happen there. That's, you know, some of which are labelled as diseases, some of which aren't. And I've sort of grouped all these together in various different kinds of loss, things like loss of hearing or loss of muscle or loss of vision and that kind of thing. And the sort of umbrella for all of these is loss of independence, because as you get older, you get less, less able to get around the house, less able to you know, go out and play with your grandkids, socialise with your friends, because these various kinds of loss eat away at your independence and you know, remove your ability to do the things that you'd like to do. And then finally, we've got the things that aren't directly related to the ageing process, but nonetheless uh, significantly worse when you get to an older age. 
and that's things like infections and injuries. So, you know, imagine you're a young person, you're in your 20s and you break, break a bone. What that probably means is a few weeks in a plaster cast, your bone will fairly rapidly heal. But if you're in your 70s or your 80s and you break a bone, it's very common to break a hip at that age. That can mean an extended stay in hospital and you're then stuck in a bed for weeks and weeks. That means you experience muscle wastage. Maybe you contract a secondary infection in hospital. Um, and if you know that whole chain of events doesn't end up killing you, it can still end up dramatically affecting the future course of your life. So something that you sort of shrugged off with a f in a few weeks as a young person can really dramatically affect you as you get older. So this whole constellation of changes uh, combines to be the ageing process. And so now we can look at this graph and see not just the death, but the sort of whole panoply of changes that, um, that underlie that death. And particularly what causes all these deaths is, of course, those diseases that I mentioned. So now let's slightly change this graph. It's still age along the bottom, but up the side, we've got your risk of getting a particular disease. And those diseases I mentioned, cancer, heart disease, stroke, dementia, you can see they've all got a very similar exponential looking risk, uh, you know, that rapidly, rapidly increases toward the end of life. And the chance of getting diagnosed with these diseases really, really gets very much higher. And that's because, as I said, these diseases are basically caused by the underlying ageing process. Um, to mention one of these things that isn't directly caused by it, but again becomes much more severe, this disgusting mucusy green line it represents chest infections. Um, this isn't just coughs and sniffles, this is you know, serious things that get in deep into your lungs. And as you can see, you know, you've still got a reasonable chance, maybe you know, one or two percent, even at your lowest risk of uh, getting one of these infections at any point in your life. But when you're young and your immune system's naive and hasn't really seen very much, or when you're old and your immune system's starting to decline because of ageing, you're much, much more likely to get one of these diseases. And that, of course, is why your flu jab is so important, especially as you get older, because that means that you're protecting yourself against one of these respiratory infections. But far more than flu, of course, there has been one thing that's really rammed this home in the last sort of year or so. And if we look at your chance of death per um, chance of death, sorry, if infected, that should say, if infected with the coronavirus, then that looks like this as well. It's got this uh, terrifying exponential increase once more. And in fact, it's rising at an even faster rate than the risk of death overall. Uh, if you catch coronavirus in your 20s, you're literally hundreds of times less likely to die than someone who catches COVID in their 80s. Now, luckily, in the US and the UK, um, a lot of our 80-year-olds are vaccinated now, so this curve would look very, very different if you looked at uh, you know people who've been vaccinated. But nonetheless, this really just shows us the huge, huge impact the ageing process has on our ability to fight off infections and our ability to fight off stresses generally. So back to this graph you know there's, there's this myth that you can just die of old age you know you, you you grow old gracefully and then one night you just pass away peacefully in your sleep with no suffering but that actually isn't mostly how old people die the vast majority of old people get one of these diseases it advances over years or decades sometimes the treatment can be very hard work as well and eventually it becomes severe enough to take your life whether that's cancer or whether that's heart disease it you know robs your independence during the time that you're sick with it and then eventually become so serious that you die from it as well. And often you have multiple of these different diseases at once. Um, the average 80 year old has five different diagnoses and is taking a similar number of medications to try and counter those diagnoses. So it's a really, really serious uh, effect on your quality of life overall. So that's why aging causes quite so much suffering. Um, but you might be thinking about this and looking at, you know, back to this, uh, my, my favourite graph. I did say it was a graph that caused me to change my career. So, you know, we're going to be <laughs> going to be seeing this a couple more times. You might be looking at this graph and thinking about that risk of diseases and thinking, you know, this is something that we in the rich world, we're perversely lucky enough to have this because we can live long enough to experience these terrible effects of ageing. So uh, normally in the pre-Zoom world, I'd have given this uh, a, a sort of audience quiz. So I'd like you to think about this at home. Um, what do you think global life expectancy is now? So the average life expectancy for every country in the world. And the reason that I like to ask this question is because a lot of people predict it's quite significantly younger than is actually the case. And, you know, if you do surveys of these people, people guess it's 10 or 20 years lower than is actually the, num the real number. And that's because I think a lot of us are taught in school that there's this, there's this massive developing world. They're very poor countries, they're countries with poor healthcare systems, poor access to sanitation, all kinds of different issues. And what that means is that they're living much, much shorter lives uh, than we in the rich world are. But actually, there's been a huge acceleration in living standards in poor countries. And what that means is that global life expectancy has really, really caught up with a lot of the richer countries over the last sort of 50 years or so. And I'm going to put you out of your misery now. I hope you've got your guess in your head. Global life expectancy, the most recent number we've got for it back in 2019, it was 72.6 years. Now, this is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it means people are living longer, healthier lives than ever before. It's fantastic news. But on the other, it means that most people in most countries are living long enough to get a significant way up this curve. They're living long enough to experience a significant number of the side effects of growing old, you know, the suffering, the diseases, the causes of death. And uh, what this means, if we break this down, looking at global death statistics, is that of the 150,000 people who die every day on planet Earth, so every one of those little stick figures is representing 1,000 people, over a hundred thousand of those people die because of aging 
So more than two thirds of deaths around the world are caused by aging. And this fundamentally is why I think that aging is the world's largest humanitarian challenge. It's the cause of by far the majority of death, and also I would contend the majority of suffering. Because as we've seen, you know, the ways that you go from aging, they're horrible. They drag out your death over years or decades. They can sap your quality of life. Even the things that actually kill you can reduce your independence. And what that means is that aging is this enormous sort of tsunami of death and suffering. It's, it's something that we really should be looking as scientists and as a global community to be doing something about. So this could be quite a depressing thesis and uh, it's much more interesting to think, you know, what can we do about it? So one more time back to this graph. As I said, our risk of death as human beings doubles about every seven or eight years. But what I'd like to do is have a look at some other animals in the animal kingdom. And this is a particularly striking example. This is a little creature called a hydra. It's a freshwater animal. Uh, it's about a centimetre long, so it's very, very small. And um, the, the first reason that hydra came to the attention of the scientific community is because they've got incredible regenerative powers. You can chop off basically any bit you like of a hydra, and it will grow into a second fully functioning hydra. And the original hydra will just grow back whatever you chopped off. So they've got this really, really incredible power of regeneration. But as scientists were studying them, they noticed something else amazing about them too. Their risk of death doesn't do what humans does as they get older. In fact, their risk of death with age looks something more like this. It's just completely flat. Uh, this is something called negligible senescence. They effectively don't grow old. They don't become more likely to die. Um, you know, they just carry on throughout their years. And we actually obviously haven't done this experiment because we haven't had uh, any lab looking at these hydra for long enough. But it's estimated that if this risk of death really does stay as flat as that, it's about 0.2% a year. Um, into the indefinite future, we'd expect around 10% of these tiny little beasties to still be alive after a thousand years, which is just really incredible. Um, but what's most amazing isn't their fantastic longevity, it's this negligible senescence. It's the fact that their risk of death doesn't change as we get older. So, you know, can we learn something from these creatures and become a little bit more hydra ourselves? Now, you might be thinking, Andrew, come on, you know, this is a centimetre long pond creature. How, how much possibly can we learn to apply this to human beings? Well, there are actually creatures that are much, much closer to humans that display this property too. Um, this beautiful beast is a Galapagos tortoise, and the oldest one on record lived, we think, to about 177 years old. Um, and again, these creatures are negligibly senescent. Because they're a lot, a lot closer to humans than Hydra, we know that not only do the, does their chance of death not change as they get older, we also know that they don't become frail. They don't, um, they don't lose any of their uh, powers to heal. They don't lose any of their reproductive capacity. Even there's a, there's a fantastic story I read in the press a few years ago about Jonathan, uh, which is, who is a slightly different species of tortoise. But he's the oldest known tortoise in the world at the moment. He's uh, uh, co coming up on his 190th birthday, and apparently he still likes to get it on with the ladies. So you know they're very much enjoying life. Right Right until the end. So, you know, could we be a bit more tortoise? Well, again, tortoises, they're not particularly close relatives of ours, uh, but this is a much, much closer relative. This, you might be thinking, this is a penis with teeth, Andrew. It's actually something called a naked mole rat. It's a little tiny mammal. It's about the size of a rat or a mouse. But amazingly, you know, mice live to maybe two, three, four years if you keep them in the lab. This thing can live into its 30s. And again, it's negligibly senescent. There's no loss of capacity with age. Even though this thing looks incredibly wrinkly, um, it stays fit and it stays healthy and it stays reproductively active until very, very late in their life. We actually even thought these creatures were completely immune to cancer until just a few years ago when some scientists studying really big colonies of them did find a, f a handful of tumours in them. Uh, they appear to be resistant to neurodegenerative disease. These are creatures that appear to get old, but without becoming elderly. So the question is, how can we learn from their biology? Or how can we adapt, uh, you know, take some of these ideas and turn them into medicines for human beings? So we return to this question, what is ageing? And these answers that I gave before, they're sort of cheats. They're not very helpful answers uh, for two different reasons. The first is that these are really very, very large, high-level categories. Every single one of these could have, you know, tens or hundreds of subtypes. You know, cancer, there are hundreds of different kinds of cancer. If you talk about memory loss, there are so, so many different ways that your brain can lose the capacity to store its memories, acting on whole, you know, very, very different levels within inside our biology. Um, and also, we tend to treat them one at a time. So if you get cancer, you go to your oncologist, they might give you some chemotherapy or radiotherapy or send you for surgery, but they largely ignore everything else that's wrong with you. They don't you know, try and, if you've got heart disease at the same time, which a lot of old people have, that's treated by a separate doctor in a separate building. Um, and we, we treat all these very, very differently. We often treat them in a way that's treating the end causes. You know, if you've got uh, muscle loss, we don't try and improve the state of your muscles, we'll often just give you a walking stick. So the problem is these aren't root causes, they're end stages. There are loads and loads and loads of them, and we tend to treat them in a very sort of, um, a very siloed way, very, very separately. So I'm going to try and answer this question in a slightly different way. If you ask an ageing biologist what is ageing, they might give you an answer that looks something like this. These are the 10 hallmarks of ageing that I talk about in my book, and you don't need to read every single one of them. And some of them have, uh, you know, quite sciencey sounding names. 
Um, and you'll be relieved to hear I'm not going to go into every single one of these now. But there, there are a variety of different ways that this list is much more exciting than the slide that I showed you just now. The first reason is that these are the fundamental cellular and molecular underpinnings of why we age. Most age-related diseases can be chalked up to a variety, you know, just a handful of these different changes. And so the idea is that if we go after these changes, we can potentially slow down or even reverse the progression of all the different things. You know, everything from wrinkles and grey hair to muscle loss to cancer to dementia. All of them are caused by these various different things. And I think the reason that I talked about this being more uh, as exciting as uh, the discovery of antibiotics is because you can go after one of these hallmarks and potentially hit several or even all of those age-related changes at the same time. Now, as I said, I've not got time to go through the whole list, but I'm just going to choose a couple to highlight. Um, the first one that I'm going to go for is this, number two, trimmed telomeres. And the reason that I'm going to talk about that is that's one of the most common questions you get when you uh, tell people that you're writing a book about ageing biology. Has that got something to do with telomeres? And the answer is yes, but it's a bit complicated. So let me explain how so. Uh, this is a beautiful fluorescence microscopy image that you might see if you look down inside the nucleus of one of your cells. You're looking at the DNA, the genetic instruction manual uh, for constructing a human being or indeed another animal. And uh, what you can see here, this blue stuff, they've put some fluorescent dye on the DNA. So that's just showing you the DNA, the chromosomes uh, inside the cell. But these little red and green dots on the ends of the chromosomes, these are the telomeres. They're the start and the end of those chromosomes and they act as protective caps on the end of our DNA. Uh, if you were to zoom in on one of those telomeres and uh, simplify the picture somewhat, it would look a little bit like this. It's just a string of repeated DNA letters over and over again. So you know that DNA is made up of four letters, A, T, C and G. And the telomeres are just TTA, GGG, TTA, GGG, TTA, GGG, and on and on and on, hundreds or even thousands of times. So the question is, why do our chromosomes, these incredibly detailed you know, instruction manuals for building a human being, have these you know, basically strings of repeated nonsense on the end of each of them? And the answer is, they've been constructed to solve some uh, really rather ridiculous problems that evolution has left us with. The first is that they protect the ends of our chromosomes from our DNA repair systems. And that's because uh, if you just find a loose flailing bit of DNA around, you know, flailing around uh, in one of your cells, that probably means that DNA has been damaged. And so your cell would try to uh, fuse those bits of DNA together, stick them back and fix whatever the damage was. We don't want our chromosomes, which aren't damaged, being fused together. So the telomeres basically tell that DNA repair machine, we don't worry, this is what it should look like. It also, they also exist to correct for a very strange mistake that our cells have when it comes to reproducing. So when a cell divides, they have to copy all of that DNA and make sure that both cells have a full repertoire of DNA in order to go on doing what they need to do as daughters. And uh, the problem is that when our cells duplicate that DNA, the enzyme that does the duplication moves along the DNA, but it can't quite make it all the way to the end of a chromosome. So it ends up having to chop a tiny bit off every time a cell divides. And you can obviously see the problem here. If this was chopping off critical DNA, if it was a gene that was coding for something really, really important that told your cell how to do what it's supposed to do, then every time your cells divided, you'd lose a little bit of that important DNA and your cells would slowly lose their function. So the good news is you've got these telomeres, these sort of hundreds or thousands of bases of repeated nonsense, which mean that then the DNA can chop a tiny bit off the end and nothing important gets lost. But you can see that this is a rather temporary reprieve from this situation, right? Because, you know, you stick a few thousand bases like this on the end, but every time your cell divides, it loses, you know, a few tens or a few hundreds of these bases. And that means that eventually you are going to get down to that important DNA. So it's not a long term solution to the problem. And this, you can really see why this could be a problem, uh, why this could be one of the causes of ageing. Because as we get older, our cells divide to replace cells that have been lost. And as they divide, they lose a bit of those telomeres. And that means the telomeres are getting gradually shorter as we get older. So how much shorter do they get? Well, this is a graph. Uh, again, we've got age along the bottom and we've got the length of the telomeres up on the, uh, on the y-axis here. And if I stick a graph, uh, stick, some, stick some points on this graph, every single one of these is an individual person and the length of their telomeres as measured in their blood. You can see there is a trend, but it's not the greatest trend in the world. You can see that some uh, particularly lucky 90 year olds actually have telomeres as long as some unfortunate 30 year olds. There's really quite a lot of dispersion on this. And there's also some uh, particularly wacky people. These are probably outliers. Otherwise, this person must be telomere wolverine, basically. They've got incredible regenerative powers. Um, if we draw a line of best fit through that data, you can see that the average decrease in length of telomeres is something like 20 bases, so 20 DNA letters uh, every year of your life. And so there is a gradual decrease, but it's not the best predictor in the world. But nonetheless, it does seem like an obvious candidate for a cause of ageing. And actually, if you look at the data in humans, people who have short telomeres for their age tend to have worse health and they tend to die more, uh, die more quickly, die sooner, basically. So clearly there's something going on here.
And that, again, could be quite a depressing thing, apart from that we do have something that we can do about it. And what we can do is use this enzyme called telomerase. This was discovered uh, back in the 1980s and actually garnered a Nobel Prize in 2009 for its three co-discoverers, Elizabeth Blackburn, Carol Greider and Jack Shostak. And together what they did was they discovered there's an enzyme that can add extra letters to the end of these telomeres. It can add more of those telom telomeric repeats and build those telomeres back up. Um, and it's actually deactivated in most adult cells. Um, so the question is, can we turn that telomerase back on and then, you know, cure aging. We can <laughs> increase the length of those telomeres, allow our cells to carry on dividing, allow them to carry on replacing our old cells, and thus, you know, manifest in, uh, you know, improved longevity, improved health for all of us. Now, it might seem a bit bizarre that evolution hasn't already done this, but actually that's because it's a cancer defense mechanism. Let's think about what cancer is for a moment. Cancer is what happens when a cell gained the ability to divide an infinite number of times. And so, you know, a cell just carries on dividing and dividing and dividing, and if it's got the right combination of mutations, it can keep on doing that indefinitely. And that means that it can grow big enough to become a tumour, it can grow big enough to spread around your body, and that's how cancer ultimately goes on to kill you. And actually the first experiments in mice, where um, the mice were given telomerase, they were basically told to carry on using that gene much, much more than they would do so naturally. There was a very unfortunate side effect, which is the mice basically got a lot of cancer. And so, you know, when this was being done, these first experiments were being done in the late 90s and early 2000s. This, this basically burst the telomerase bubble. I remember some very excitable documentaries that I, I watched back when I was at school saying, you know, we basically found the fountain of youth and it was telomerase. But of course, we then found that it's effectively pre-ticking a box on cancer's list. It doesn't automatically create cancer, adding telomerase, but it does mean that the cells have already got a way to extend their telomeres and it helps them divide that infinite number of times. So, you know, as I say, this really burst the bubble. And I think, you know, partly it's just it's a nice cynical narrative. You've got this supposed fountain of youth that then turns out to actually be more complicated and not work quite like that. But uh, fascinatingly, much more recent research has shown that there are a variety of ways that we can get around this cancer problem. And the first uh, result that showed this was back in 2008, when mice were given an extra copy, not only of telomerase, not only were they having extra uh, of this DNA, uh, of this telomere increasing enzyme, they were also given three other genes. Now, I won't go into the details of exactly what these do, but basically they're anti-cancer genes. They're genes that convince cells that if they're looking a bit dodgy, they should maybe commit suicide um, or maybe go senescent, which means they stop dividing. Um, hold that thought, actually, senescent cells are going to come back in the next part of the talk. Uh, but the point being, if you've got this telomerase, it might pre-tick something uh, box on cancer's list. But if you've got these anti-cancer genes, then what that means is that actually, in combination, these mice actually lived 40% longer than mice that hadn't been given this genetic modification, and they didn't seem to get any extra cancer. So if you do a naive genetic manipulation and just add telomerase, then that doesn't work. But if you add in a few extra genes that can hopefully prevent that cancer, then it does seem to improve mouse lifespan and give them longer, healthier lives. And a more recent experiment, which is perhaps more uh, optimistic for the rest of us, you know, who haven't, uh, haven't had our cells modified from birth to have extra genes inside them, is that mice that were given some temporary telom telomerase, they were injected uh, with a gene therapy that just added some telomerase for a short period of time, thus extended their telomeres, but didn't sort of pre-check this checkbox for cancer, they lived 20% longer when they were given this injection about a, at the age of about a year old, which is about 40 years old in human years, if you sort of convert mouse age to human age. Um, and they were also living uh, not just longer, but also healthier. They had things like higher bone density, they had plumper skin, and they had better performance walking a tightrope, which I guess is something we can all aspire to as we get older. So this is the reason that I'm excited. You know, we've got these different therapies that have a slightly more nuanced approach and appear to be able to extend mouse lifespan and health span. And the next stage is to translate these into human therapies. And actually that work is on ongoing right now. So back to the hallmarks, I said I was going to talk about a couple of them. The other one I'm going to mention is senescent cells, which I uh, mentioned during the course of talking about telomeres there. Um, one of the ways that a cell can become uh, enter this aged senescent state is when its telomeres get too short, and that means it stops dividing. Uh, so let's, let's talk a bit about senescent cells. Senescence, as you'll have gathered, is just the biological word meaning old. And um, what that means then is that as our, as our bodies age, we accumulate more of these aged senescent cells. And one of the reasons that I've already mentioned is when our telomeres do get very short. And that means the cells, uh, they, they, they notice these short telomeres. They think, oh, you've divided a suspicious number of times. Maybe you're at risk of becoming cancerous. So they put on the brakes and the cell stops dividing. There are various other reasons as well, like perhaps if a cell gets a lot of damage to its DNA, again, because it looks like it might be at risk of becoming cancerous. And putting on the brakes seems like a sensible move because it means that cell can't carry on dividing and can't turn into a cancer. But unfortunately, these cells don't just sit there not dividing, sort of benign elders of the cellular community. What they do is they pump out a toxic cocktail of molecules whose primary purpose is to tell the immune system to come and clear up these senescent cells because we don't need them in our bodies. And it's better if the immune system can come over and gobble them up and get rid of them. 
But unfortunately, as we get older, um, our immune system gets less effective at clearing these senescent cells. We get more ways that we can acquire them because the DNA damage is more frequent, our telomeres are getting shorter, and so on. And that means they tend to accumulate with time. And the other effect that these molecules can have is they can accelerate the aging process globally. Now, what's really exciting is that we've got drugs that can get rid of these senescent cells. It can kill the senescent cells, but leave the other cells in your body unharmed. And this has actually been done in mice. We've given mice these so-called senolytic drugs. And uh, let's talk about an experiment that was done about five years ago now. It was an experiment where they took some mice that were 24 months old. So these are quite old by, by, by mouse standards. They're about equivalent to a 70-year-old human being. And you give the mice this, uh, this senolytic drug, so it gets rid of some of their senescent cells. And what they found was it basically makes the mice biologically younger. So if you give mice senolytics, they get less cancer, they get less heart disease, they get fewer cataracts. So that's all good news from a disease point of view. They also live longer, which is suggestive of, an, uh, of, a, of a slowing of the aging process. They live a couple of months longer on average, which is something like, you know, maybe a few years in human terms. But they're not just sort of hobbling on, you know, not diseased, not dying, but, you know, still, still in the sort of geriatric late stage of life. They're living, as I said, biologically younger. They can run further and faster on a little mousy treadmill that they're using these experiments. They, they're more curious when you put them in a maze, uh, more similar to sort of a younger mouse's style of behaviour. They even have better fur. <laughs> so, you know, these mice, they just look fantastic. And what's clear is that by targeting these hallmarks, by targeting something like uh, shortening telomeres or targeting senescent cells, you can really globally reverse the aging process, not just target a single disease, not make these mice live longer in ill health, but actually improve their health for the rest of their life and make them live longer as a sort of side effect of that. And that is fantastically exciting news. And what's really cool about these senolytics is they're even closer to human realization than telomerase therapy is. We've actually got about 20 or 30 companies who are trying to turn these treatments from things that are on the lab bench to things that are happening in the clinic. And the first human trials have already started. They started back in 2018. The way this is probably going to pan out is that um, the first treatments will be for people who've got uh, particular diseases where we know that senescent cells are, uh, are causative of those diseases. So things like, uh, um, things like arthritis, things like lung fibrosis that commonly occurs in older people. But if these drugs work, obviously, and if they prove, most importantly, prove safe, we could start thinking about giving them preventatively to people who are, you know, in their 50s or maybe their 60s, who don't have any particular disease that we'd currently diagnose, but they were just born a long time ago. We know they've accumulated a lot of these senescent cells, and that by clearing them out, we can prevent those people from getting ill in the first place. And that's the real dream of anti-aging medicine, preventative medicine that can slow down or even reverse certain aspects of aging and stop us from becoming ill. So I just thought very quickly to end the talk, uh, I'd ask the question, should we cure aging? And it's a bit of a strange question this for me, because, you know, if I just given a talk about cancer research, I would never get anyone asking me in the Q&A at the end, uh, you know, shouldn't we be um, concerned that if we, you know, cure all these people with cancer, we're going to have a sudden increase in population on our hands. And um, that's going to mean that, you know, we're going to have trouble uh, de dealing with the environmental consequences of this cancer cure. But when you're an ageing researcher, you often get these kinds of questions at the end of talks. We, we really seem to place ageing research in a separate moral and ethical category to other kinds of medical research. And um, the way I'm going to answer this is I'm going to give a bit of a generic answer, actually. There are loads of different questions there. You know, there's population, there's whether there, there'll be equal access to these treatments or whether they'll be, uh, you know, only available to the rich. Um, there, 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 you know, questions like, won't dictators live forever? It just opens a whole can of ethical worms. But the way that I'd like you to think about this is to turn the question around. It's to say, imagine that we lived in an ageless civilization, a society that didn't degenerate with time, you know, where people lived healthy, long lives and, you know, then, then just dropped off a cliff, basically, at a certain age and died. Um, would you invent aging to solve any of these problems? So imagine, you know, we lived in a civilization, we lived on an Earth where we had 20 billion people, the planet was straining, we had climate change, we had huge overuse of resources, uh, that, you know, that, that there was an environmental catastrophe going on. Is the way that you'd solve that problem to invent aging? Would you, you know, condemn people to decades of slow degeneration and suffering um, and the, these horrible, horrible diseases in order to try and alleviate our environmental challenges? I really don't think you would. I think if you, you know, you'd exhausted every other possibility, you'd, you'd tried to reduce our footprint on the environment, you'd tried to, you know, make things greener, you'd tried to reduce the amount of meat people ate, and none of these things were working, you decided the only thing you could do was kill people. And I really suggest that should be an option of last resort. You certainly wouldn't do it in this incredibly inhumane way by causing them to de degenerate, lose their um, senses, their faculties, their independence slowly over years and years and years before finally succumbing to one of a panoply of horrible diseases. I think you'd want to try and give them a you know, painless lethal injection if, if that was the route you actually had to go down. 
And I think this applies to all of the different questions that you might ask. Whatever the problem is, would you invent ageing to solve inequality? Would you invent ageing to sort of kill off a dictator? I, I just really don't think you ever would. And so I think because the moral case is watertight to not invent ageing in a certain civilization where you're trying to solve a problem, you can transfer that across by reversing the question. And it just isn't morally acceptable to try and prevent medical research from happening in order to solve other kinds of problems. The final thing I wanted to talk about quickly was funding. Um, and that's because I really, really want to raise the profile of this area of research in order to make sure that we fund it in proportion to the scale of the challenge. Um, and I'm going to give some figures here, the cost of various chronic diseases uh, in the US. So things like cancer, heart disease, stroke, dementia, you'll notice these are my four sort of favourite diseases it's because they're the four leading killers in, uh, in the modern world. And if you look at those things, these all cost hundreds of billions of dollars a year. And if you add those together, these aren't even all the age-related diseases you, you, you know to note. And it's getting on for, it's, it's really, really quite close to a trillion dollars. So if you added together all the different various costs of ageing, then it's going to come to this enormous, enormous sum. Now let's compare that to how much you spend researching ageing. In the US, you're quite lucky, you're unusual, because there is an organisation called the National Institutes of Ageing. Uh, the NIA gets about $3.5 billion a year. Now, just to emphasise, this uh, little square is actually in proportion to the scale of the amount of money that's spent. So this is really quite a tiny amount compared to that enormous cost of age-related diseases, compared to the $4 trillion a year that's spent on healthcare in the US. Less than a thousandth of it goes into the NIA. And actually, it's even worse than that. There's a running joke in biogerontology, the sort of ageing science uh, circles. The NIA stands not for National Institute on Aging, but National Institute on Alzheimer's Disease. And that's because the significant bulk of the NIA budget goes to the neuroscience division. Um, about two of those three and a half billion uh, goes into basically researching Alzheimer's disease. Then there's various other stuff that accounts for another billion or so. And if you get down to the actual aging biology, it's about $350 million a year. So that's about a dollar per American. Goes into researching why it is that we age and how that we could stop it. And when you look at the huge, huge cost of aging to our society, it just doesn't make any sense that this number should be quite so small. So I really want to raise the profile of this field. I want policymakers and politicians to be thinking about trying to increase the size of this research budget. I want you, know, uh, I want, I want you people to read the book, to write to your representatives, to tell them how important this is. I want scientists and doctors to realise the huge, huge importance of this. You know, the economic case is already an incredibly powerful thing in that we could spend a tiny, tiny bit more on researching it and try and reduce this enormous cost to society. And that's before you get onto the enormous humanitarian challenge. So fundamentally, that is why I wrote this book. Um, you know, I wanted to raise the profile. I want people to be talking about this in pubs and bars and you know dinner parties when those are safe to do again. I want policymakers and politicians to be talking about this. I want the biologists and medics that I know don't get enough about uh, ageing in their education to understand how important this is and devote their careers to doing something about it. Um, I've just got a couple of pictures here. I know that most of you watching will be in the US, so that's what your book cover looks like. But for other people in the rest of the world, this is the UK cover as well. Um, if you want to find out a bit more about the book and buy a copy, there are some links at uh, ageless.link. I know that you can also get it from the Harvard Bookstore, so do think about checking that out. And uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter and find out a bit more about all this stuff, I'm at Stato. Um, I think that's about all I want to uh, give as a sort of quick introduction to the book, overview of the ageing biology. And now I think we've got time for a few questions. Hello. Thank you, Andrew, so much for that informative talk, the beautiful Thank visuals. Um, I'm excited to get into these questions. We've got some great ones from the audience. If you have a question at any point, please enter it in the Q&A box and we'll get to it as soon as we can. So I'm just going to start off with this question from an anonymous attendee that says, what things do you currently do in an attempt to live longer? Yeah, there's actually a chapter of health advice in the book, and I called it How to Live Long Enough to Live Even Longer. And the reason that I did that is because if I can live long enough in good health, I can be alive in time for more of these treatments to be developed. And that's just really exciting to me. So it really, really compelled me. I mean, it really compelled me to follow some of this health advice. Um, some of it is surprisingly obvious. So it's things like not smoking, you know, eating a variety of different foods and not too much of them, getting enough exercise, getting enough sleep and that kind of thing. And uh, what I found was, firstly, that the, I found these more compelling because I want to live long enough to live, you know, to experience some of these treatments. But secondly, because um, once you understand something about the biology of aging, you really realise that actually this health advice it effectively slows down the aging process. And I go into some detail as you know why it is that these things work. 
it's not just preventing a single disease. It's not like exercise only benefits your heart or only benefits your muscles. It actually has this global benefit on the whole aging process. You know, exercising improves your mental health, your brain power, your it slows cognitive decline. It reduces your risk of cancers. Not all cancers, but some cancers can be, you know, have, have their risk reduced by exercise. It's incredible the sort of global benefits that accrue by following these basic bits of health advice. So I'd highly, highly recommend it. I know it sounds boring, but those are really, really uh, important. And the other thing is there are... Um, there are some less conventional bits of health advice that understanding aging biology can illuminate. And one of those is that, um, is brushing your teeth. I think this is my favorite example. We now understand that um, if you have good dental hygiene, that can have uh, effectively slow down the aging process. And the reason is a lot of aging is driven by uh, something called chronic inflammation. So to sort of rewind a bit, what is inflammation? Inflammation is the normal process by which our bodies fight off disease or heal wounds and that kind of thing. It's the way that uh, our bodies call attention to the site of an injury or the site of an infection, call over the immune system, you know, bring in the cavalry and solve that problem. And in young people, that's a good thing. It's often called acute inflammation. That means inflammation that's brief. It comes in, it solves the problem, and then it dies away again as quickly as it arrived. And that means that, you know, uh, it doesn't sort of fizz away in the background the whole time. Whereas as we get older, inflammation becomes chronic. It's a sort of constant paranoia of our immune system. And that's one of these things that effectively accelerates the whole aging process. So if you imagine you've got uh, poor dental hygiene, you've got gum disease, you've got tooth decay, that's a constant standoff in your mouth between these bacteria and the, um, and the various uh, parts of your immune system. And so that's driving chronic inflammation. So there's fairly good evidence of a link between uh, poor dental hygiene and heart health. So things like uh, you know, heart disease and strokes. And there's improving evidence, it's sort of the first evidence is starting to come in that it might even be linked to cognitive decline and dementia. So it's absolutely incredible to realise that, uh, you know, brushing your teeth potentially can reduce your risk of dementia. And so that's really, really encouraged me to, you know, make sure I religiously blush, brush my teeth and floss every day just to ensure that I'm, you know, slowing my ageing process down as much as possible. <laughs> It was great to hear. It makes me feel really good about investing in an electric toothbrush during quarantine for the first time. <laughs> Definitely. Um, all right, I'm going to move on to this question from Barry, who says, will some medical problems or a certain age limit prevent people from benefiting from anti-aging treatments? I don't think they will, because a lot of these drugs have a have this really global effect. Um, I mean, obviously, there are always certain health conditions that where you can't take a particular drug or there are certain health conditions. Or there are certain drugs that you take that might you know, interfere with another drug. But there are just so many different options on the table. I'm really confident that something's you know, these things are going to happen in the next few years. So unless you're already very old or very unwell, some of these things are going to happen in time for you. As I said, you know, senolytics are already in human trials. So we could be seeing these appearing in hospitals, admittedly, at first for specific conditions in the next few years. So it's really not inconceivable that you know a few years after that we could start rolling them out preventatively and there's another drug that i i didn't talk about in my talk by doing the book called metformin which is a diabetes drug currently that we think might slow down the aging process more globally um and there's actually a trial go it was it was supposed to start uh, more recently sorry it was supposed to it was supposed to start a while ago but it's been delayed because of covid um called tame which is targeting aging with metformin and so the idea is they're going to try and use this metformin uh to slow down the aging process they're going to do a proper randomized trial where they give half of people metformin and half of people a placebo drug and this is a really commonly prescribed drug we've been giving it out in the uk since the 1950s we've got a huge huge sort of safety record on this it's, it costs pence per dose and if that trial works out we could just roll that out instantly immediately um so you know that's something that i think we can be very confident if it works that will arrive in time for for, for many 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 people so yeah, I, I don't think there's any reason for pessimism unless you're absolutely on death's door, then you know this stuff could potentially arrive in time for you. That is great to hear. And that also addresses a couple of the other questions we had in our queue. Another question was asked about metformin. Um, so on that note, I'm gonna turn to Bruce's question. And I believe someone else asked about this too. Can NAD, Nick, Nic nicotine amide riboside chloride or niacin helps the aging? It's a great question. There's some really fascinating sort of preliminary lab data about these things. Um, you know, there, there, there are various studies where they've given them to older mice and shown things like improved muscle function. And in particular, the place that these um, these compounds seem to have the most effect or the thing that they're, they're given for is the mitochondria, which are often in a, a bit of a cliche called the powerhouse of the cell. So these are the tiny little organelles inside all of your cells that generate all the energy. So that's what they're hoping to try and improve the performance of. What we're really lacking is, is really decent long-term lifespan data. So I think actually there was a recent... Um, there's there's a very big um there's a, there's a very big trial program called the interventions testing program that's done in the states it's done in three uh different uh research labs in the us 
And what they do is they have very, very rigorous protocols and try and determine which medications and which interventions can prolong the lifespan of mice. I think NMN, I can't actually remember if it was NMN, which is a precursor of the NAD molecule you just mentioned, or if it was NAD itself, was tested in the last round of the interventions testing program. And I think they showed it had no effect. Um, which isn't to say it definitely doesn't work. Obviously, they might have got that there. You can change the dose, you can change the interval at which you give these things. So it's, it's never to completely write it off. But I just think we haven't got the solid data for those things yet to show that they do improve health in the long term. They certainly seem to have some really sort of tempting indicative studies that show they can do things on cells in a dish. They can improve the sort of health of uh, of mice in late life. The question is, do they actually slow down aging? And I think at this moment, you know, hopefully we'll know soon because trials are ongoing. But right now, I don't think we know quite enough. You know, I I, I wouldn't feel confident taking it myself just yet. Um, all right, this next question is from Stephen, who asks, I was wondering, lifespan has increased due to science and medicine, but what impact has pollution, perhaps increased stress as well, from our industrial society decreased lifespan? That's a fascinating and very difficult question to answer. I think, uh, so, so the, the good news is that in most countries around the world, lifespan continues to increase. But uh, you, pro you might know that in the US and actually the UK as well, there's been quite a flat lining of lifespan. And in fact, in the US, there have been certain age groups where lifespan has been declining. Uh, these so-called deaths of despair, uh, in, in particularly affecting people of, in middle age. So it's, it's just an incredibly complicated picture because there are so many things going on. And, and another really big sort of headwind for increasing lifespan is obesity. And these things are subtracting from lifespan, but it seems from at the moment, things like improved medical care and improved health generally, in, you know, improved diets, improved exercise, improved lifestyle, better preventative medicine uh, seem to be counteracting those effects. But I do think these are very serious problems. And actually, there's, there's some good evidence that pollution, it's, it's a bit like smoking. You know, the primary effects of pollution are on the lungs. Uh, you know, clearly that's the thing that's going to bear the brunt of these these tiny particulates and gases and stuff that you breathe in. But actually, they do seem to cause inflammation and potentially cause changes all around the body that do seem to accelerate the aging process. So I very much hope that, you know, alongside developing anti-aging medicines, we're going to carry on with our attempts to reduce, uh, you know, pollution in urban centres and that kind of thing, because clearly it has a negative effect on our health. And I think the simplest way to conceptualise that effect is that it does indeed increase the rate of ageing. Uh, as I say, thankfully for now, those things have been sort of counteracted by other effects. But we should obviously just be trying everything we can to, you know, to improve people's li healthy lifespans. Uh, all right. William asks, is aging intentional from an evolutionary perspective? The fact that calorie restriction lengthens lifespan during famines in many species suggests the body is holding something back when times are good. Yeah, it's, that's a really great question. I think it's intentional is the wrong word, but it's clearly um, it's 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 not an accident that a lot of species age, right? So, the simplest way to understand why aging evolved. <coughs> oh, sorry, excuse me. Um, yeah, I, th I think I'll let, let's rewind. So the, the the thing is, people often say that evolution is survival of the fittest, right? And so you might be looking at aging and thinking, this is very strange. This is a process of gradual deterioration. What on earth is fitness optimizing about growing old, about, you know, be becoming frail, becoming, you know, losing your senses, becoming slower, uh, getting diseases in late life? The fact is that in the wild, animals uh, die of all kinds of other things that aren't aging related. So let's let's think about a really short lived species like mice. Uh, what are the risks that a mouse has in its in its everyday life? Well, there are loads and loads of them. There are predators, there are cats out to get it. There's disease that's you know rife in wild mouse populations. There's even death from exposure. You know, a mouse can just get really, really cold and they've got such tiny bodies and such small sort of reserves of energy to keep themselves warm. Uh, they, they can just die on a cold night and die, you know, just, just, just die, die like that, which means there are loads and loads of different things that can cause a mouse uh, to come a cropper. And therefore, what evolution has done is it's decided, well, rather than investing in really, really extensive anti-cancer defences, rather than you know making sure that a mouse definitely won't get heart disease into its fourth decade, instead evolution has invested a lot of resources in making the mice grow up quickly, get to reproductive capacity quickly, and pump out those little kids as fast as possible, in the hope that the mouse can become reproductively active, have a few litters of kids before it gets killed by something else. And so that means that evolution basically doesn't care what happens after that mouse's reproductive lifespan. So, you know, something that potentially, if, if a mouse gets cancer age three, it just doesn't matter because most mice in the wild are already long dead by the time they get to that age. And then if you think about another animal that's a similar size, and in fact, let's talk about the naked mole rat because that was the one that I mentioned in the talk. Naked mole rats are very similar, uh, you know, they're, they're biologically very close relatives of rats and mice, but they live in these colonies underground. They burrow through these tunnels. 
and that means they're at much less risk of predation. It's obviously much safer down in these tunnels. There, there aren't cats, you know, prowling through them, uh, to take, taking them all out. And what that means is that they've got the opportunity to mature much more sedately because they're at less risk of other kinds of death. It's suddenly far more important that if a naked mole rat reaches eight, the age of three, it's quite likely still to be alive. So they've invested much more in these things like anti-cancer defences and you know defences against cognitive decline and that kind of thing because they're still going to be they're still going to be going. And so this is a trend that you find throughout the animal kingdom, uh, that an animal that has less extrinsic mortality, so that's the name that we give to the risks of death from outside of its body, will then compensate uh, for that by having a lower risk of intrinsic mortality, so basically a delayed ageing process. And exactly uh, as was asked in the question, you know, dietary restriction does seem to be a sort of measure of that. And imagine you're a mouse and there's a famine, you know, there's really, really low food supplies uh, at a moment in time for some reason or other. Then the best thing to do isn't to have kids at that exact moment. And that's because your kids are going to be born into a world where there's no food and they're basically going to starve themselves. So it's far better at that point for evolution to redirect some of that energy that would normally be put into reproducing as quickly as possible into actually maintaining the body of that animal and trying to help it survive into the next season when hopefully there'll be a bit more food. And so that's why we think that's the sort of simplest explanation as to why calorie restriction, dietary restriction puts the brakes on ageing to some extent. So yeah, it does appear to be um, that there's this sort of complicated relationship between evolution and ageing and dietary restriction is a window into that. And yeah, so hopefully that answers the question. I think so. That was very illuminating. Thank you. Um, all right. This is a question from Andres who says, how can a computational biologist use his skills to help solve aging? There is absolutely loads a computational biologist can do. And in fact, one of the great advantages of computational biology is that it's almost universally needed. You know, it, it, biology is now becoming very much a data driven science. You know, so they're obviously, you know, when you imagine a biologist, you think of someone you know, playing around with mice in the lab or dripping, you know, various different liquids onto a dish full of cells or something like that. But the fact is that more and more of those experiments then have huge, huge data readouts because, um, one of the things that, that I was working on, you know, back when I was back when I was a working computational biologist, was looking at DNA sequencing data, and that's just a fantastic example because we went from the Human Genome Project, which was the first readout of the full human genetic code, the full human DNA code, um, cost billions of dollars, completed in two thousand and one. If you'd wanted to sequence a human genome, you know, at that exact time, you know, a year later or something, it would have cost about a hundred million dollars to do that sequence, and it would have taken you know weeks and weeks of work. Whereas now we can sequence a whole human genome for less than $1,000 and we can do it in an afternoon. It's just absolutely routine. And what that means is we're generating vast, vast quantities of biological data. We can look at the whole genomes of animals, of people. We can look at uh, which genes are being used in which cells at which time. We can look at little marks all over the DNA that uh, determine how that DNA is being used. We can do proteomic studies where we can look at all the different proteins that are inside a cell and we can just generate vast, vast quantities of data. And of course, what that means is that we need computational biologists to analyse some of this enormous quantity of data. And the great news is that, um, you know, computing power has uh, actually has been outpaced by the sheer growth of the amount of data that we produce. But nonetheless, it's accelerated rapidly. We've got to the point where we can use things like machine learning and AI to dig into the data and try and find the patterns in it. And that really is the crucial thing, because, you know, it, it's, it's no use having these huge, huge reams of data if we can't extract understanding from them. And so really what that means is that if you've got computational and programming skills, hopefully you can go in and help out some of these biologists in the lab interpret some of this data. And to give a really, really concrete example of this, uh, a fascinating um, breakthrough in uh, biogerontology about a decade ago now was the idea of something called an, ep an epigenetic clock. And this is what happens when you look at the little epigenetic marks that are all over our DNA, the things that determine which genes are turned on and which genes are turned off in our cells. And a biologist called Steve Horvath thought there must be some relationship between this and ageing. And the problem was he couldn't find anyone to give him any funding to do this because it was a very speculative uh, piece of science. So what he did was he took advantage of the fact that a lot of biological data is put out online completely free for anybody to download and use. And he downloaded a whole bunch of different uh, data on a particular epigenetic mark called methylation, which is a, a, a particular thing that sticks to your DNA basically and determines, as I said, which genes are turned on and off. And he downloaded loads and loads of this data, all of which was for a variety of completely unrelated experiments, everything from developmental abnormalities to cancer to loads and loads of different stuff in, in dozens of different tissues all around the body. His only constraint was that the data had to have a marker on that told him how old the patient was when, the de when the, uh, this methylation had been taken. And he found that of those millions of methylation sites, they're called, that are all over, you know, scattered across our genome, he could take just 350 of them and determine the age of that person to within four years. 
which is absolutely incredible. In fact, it was uh, so incredible that it took him a while to get that result published because nobody, including him, believed it could really be quite that accurate. But it turns out now that these epigenetic clocks are one of the most fascinating areas of ageing research because if you have an accelerated epigenetic age, so if your epigenetic age is, is, is higher than your sort of chronological age, the number of candles on your birthday cake, then that suggests that you've aged more rapidly than someone who has a younger epigenetic age. It means you're more likely to get diseases, you're more likely to die. And we're, um, we're refining these epigenetic clocks all the time. And that's a breakthrough that was made basically purely computationally because of this culture of open data in genomics. And so it just shows you the sheer power of using computers to dig through all this data and find signals where we just didn't know if there would be any or not. That's fascinating. All right. This next question is from David, who says, more and more people that I know are talking about biohacking, and it seems to be slowly entering the mainstream. What are your thoughts about the role of biohacking with respect to the future of anti-aging activities by ordinary people? I'm really fascinated by this because it's a real um, th there's a real continuum of self experimentation going on out there. There are you know if you if you Google this you'll find there are quite a few people online who will admit to taking metformin even though they're not diabetic. They somehow get their doctor pres to prescribe it or order it from some slightly shady online pharmacy perhaps, and they take this metformin in the hope that it's going to slow their aging. And then there are people who take slightly more wacky cocktails of drugs, things like experimental senolytics, where we don't really have any human data to go on, but they're taking it speculatively, you know, based on the animal results. All the way up to a biotech CEO um, called Liz Parrish, who actually went to uh, a, a, a clinic uh, abroad because this, this couldn't legally be done in the US and had some telomerase gene therapy done to herself. And so you've got this whole spectrum of people taking this variety of different approaches from the you know relatively low risk metformin probably isn't going to kill you all the way up to having completely experimental unproven gene therapy and everything in between and because of the the fact that biology is just becoming so much more open source so much more something that you can just do in your garage these biohackers are going to have a whole lot more power and I'm really fascinated how this is going to progress and how we're going to sort of potentially regulate this and potentially try and make use of some of that data as well um, I talk about this in the very final chapter of the book because what I really hope is that you know, these people, on some level, it's pretty brave. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing anything like I'm, I'm not taking any drugs. I'm not ready for any experimental gene therapy. But at some point, we're going to have enough data that you know maybe I'll take the plunge. Maybe someone who's a bit less risk averse than I am might take the plunge sooner. And what I really want to, what I, what I really hope for is that we can somehow. Uh, you know, pull together this community of people who are interested in doing these experiments. And we've got to give them the information firstly. We, you know, we've got to make sure they understand what, their, what the risks are, what the potential benefits are, how much is known, how much is unknown, because we don't want people just you know, sort of chasing a pipe dream and doing dangerous experiments on themselves. And the second thing we've got to do then is allow them to have, you know, to somehow standardise these experiments, right? Because what we want is rather than a thousand biohackers you know brewing up a thousand different homebrew god knows what in their garage each of which differs slightly from one another and we can't be sure exactly what they've got and we can't be sure if it's quite pure and they've used a different technique and so on and so forth what would be great is if, if these people who are going to self-experiment anyway could do so in a way that allowed us to get useful data so we could standardize it we could make sure what they've got is what they think they've got and we could make sure they're all getting the same dose and then actually try and do some useful trials to try and understand you know what effect these things are having because it's going to be a really fascinating time, you know, not just for the biohacking, you know, people who are willing to give themselves experimental gene therapy end of the spectrum, but for all of us. Because as these treatments, as we do more studies, we're going to understand more about all of these different uh, things that you can do about the aging process. And the question is, when is the evidence good enough that you can take the plunge? Because, you know, the ideal scenario is that you'd be born in the year 2500 and we'd have decades and decades or even centuries and centuries of people taking all of these different medications for their whole lifetime. We know all the side effects. We know what, what effect it has on lifespan and health span and various different diseases that would be the perfect experiment but the fact is that most of us alive today don't have time to wait 70 years for the perfect experiment to be done so we're going to have to take the, these 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 drugs these treatments when they're at various different points in terms of good good or bad evidence and i think navigating that is going to be a real challenge that's something that we've got to have a much wider discussion about in the scientific community in the medical community amongst biohackers amongst the whole of society so yeah it's a bit of a can of worms and i hope that <laughs> that goes somewhere towards answering the question because it really is a very very fascinating and knotty area no, I definitely agree. And that kind of leads us into this last question here, which I think you've touched on a little bit, but um, th David is asking, can you give us some ideas of how likely it is we'll see these treatments in our lifetimes and how far we might be, for example, from telomerase treatments for humans? So I'm a scientist, and what that means is that it's very, very hard to tie me down to hard numbers, because what you'd like to hear is, oh, this is going to be developed in eight years' time. Um, but what I can say, and this, the way that I hedge my bets, but also still think this is really exciting, is that I genuinely think that a lot of these treatments are going to be available in time for most people alive today. So let's unpack what I mean by that so it's not quite so, so vague sounding. 
Um, the first thing is, as I said, these senolytic treatments, they're already in human trials. It's going to be a few years before we know whether the first ones work. It could potentially be five or ten years before we might think about giving them preventatively to give a sort of ballpark. Metformin, we will know the answer in five years, and if that works, we can just start handing it out to people. Uh, things like gene therapy and stem cell therapy, these are a bit more speculative. They, they sound a bit more sort of futuristic and sci-fi, but we're already doing some gene therapies for, you know, people who've got particularly extreme diseases that they're born with, for example. These gene therapies are approved. They're, you know, they're, they're being used in hospitals now. So as we get more used to doing these things, we're going to gradually, you know, ratchet it back from people who've got severe diseases to people who've got milder diseases until we eventually are at the point where it's safe to give them just to the general public. So, you know, even if these things are five or 10 or 15 years away, it's, it's decades, not centuries we're talking about here. And the other thing that, um, I, I, as I sort of talked about all this data in biology, toward the end of the science part of the book, I talk about how this computational revolution is going to mean that we end up doing a systems biology of aging. And to just really summarise that, we need to build computer models for human beings, because rather than targeting those 10 hallmarks of ageing I showed on that slide earlier, we need to understand how all those things interrelate. We need to intervene in cleverer ways. We don't just want to kill all the senescent cells. We want to do something more subtle and you know, improve our biology in such a way as to stabilise it and stop us growing old, to basically reprogram our bodies not to age. Now, as I was writing that, I thought that sounds, you know, crazy sci-fi. That's going to be <laughs> so far into the future. Why am I even, you know, speculating in this way? But actually, if you think about it, you know, that could easily happen in, say, the next 50 years. Because if you think about what's happened in the last 50 years, we've had a total revolution in the way that we gather data in biology. We've had a total revolution in computing power. You know, computing power has doubled every 18 months since the 1960s, and so on and so on. And so to bet against that happening in 50 years' time would be, I think, a pretty poor bet. And I think if you're in middle age and basically good health now, you could expect to, you know, get the first generation of senolytics, maybe get some telomerase gene therapy, maybe get a stem cell treatment that'll help extend your lifespan and so on and so on. And what that means is, you know, you could potentially expect, you know, I'm in my 30s, I could expect to live in, into my 80s, even if nothing else happens, even if, you know, science basically stands still. So if I do get a few, telomer a few senolytic therapies, a bit of telomerase, whatever these first treatments are, you know, maybe that'll give me five or ten extra years in good health. And that gives scientists more time to develop more treatments. And so that means that even if something does sound like it's 50 years away, that's potentially long enough, uh, or rather soon enough, for most of the people who are alive on the planet today. Because not only will their life lifespans potentially, potentially extend to almost that time, they can be extended further by the first generations of the, these anti-aging therapies. So I think we're definitely going to see the first of these anti-aging drugs in the next 10 years. And depending on how much those, you know, improve lifespan, improve health span, we could potentially be seeing much, much bigger increases in human lifespan if that sort of rate of change and progress can continue fast enough that it can be, you know, basically your funeral can carry on receding into the future as more and more technologies are developed. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to answer all these questions. And thanks to all of you for asking such thoughtful questions. Um, I just want to thank you again for this fantastic perform presentation. I feel like I learned a lot. Um, and thank you to everyone out there for spending your evening with us. Please learn more about this fascinating book and purchase Ageless at Harvard.com. And on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard Division of Science, and the Harvard Library, all here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, have a good weekend. Keep reading and please be well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.